everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here on Chicago Reacts. My name is Lauren, and today I'm going to be reacting to Attack on Pearl Harbor 1941. This was recommended by Mig Grievous, so thank you so much for recommending it. I'm excited to learn a little bit more about the Attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, if you are interested in... Uh, suggesting something that we will react to here. One of the ways you can do that is by becoming a Patreon. We really appreciate that. If you can't do that right now, then by all means, feel free to just uh, like, comment, subscribe. We do look through the comments. We do sometimes find uh, suggestions there that we then take. So again, that is the best way to get our attention. We really appreciate it when you do comment, when you do share our, these videos. And I don't really know what to expect with this particular video. Uh, a lot of the World War II stuff that have been re recommended to me have been designed to tug at my emotional heartstrings because I I cry. <laughs> uh, but this, I'm not sure if this is going to be a little bit more emotional or if it's just going to be more factual. So I'm excited to find out. I do hope to learn quite a lot about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And without further ado, let's go. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay tuned to WOR for further development. 1941, Japan situation. America and other nations have imposed an oil embargo on Japan, which means Japan cannot continue their conquests. Hmm. No problem. Japan would just get the oil it needs from the Dutch Indies. Their underfunded and undergunned fleet will pose no threat to the Imperial Japanese Navy. And if their ally, Great Britain, joins the conflict, well, Japan will fight them too. Both nations are too occupied with the European war anyways. So through their new conquests, Japan's demand for resources shall be met. However, geography has cursed them. Look at what lays beside their vital supply lines. The Philippines, mm. a US territory. Although America is not officially allied with the British and the Dutch, they are on friendly terms. Japan cannot afford the risk of the US entering the war while they are in the midst of their campaign. Their proximity to Japan's supply lines puts into jeopardy everything they are about to fight for. Basically, the Americans would be holding a dagger to Japan's throat the entire time they conduct their campaign, ready to commence hostilities at a moment's notice. Okay. Thus, they come to the conclusion that they must take out the Americans as well. This calls not only for an invasion of the Philippines, but also a preemptive strike on the powerful American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Okay, so, okay, so he might go in to explain this in just a second, but um, if their goal was to n not have America involved because they're going to be in proximity to an American territory, why are they going to go and just attack it outright? I, I would think that that would, they would know that that would incentivize America to just, to actually join the fight for real like you're attacking the actual country because i mean america is not really known for giving too much of a crap about its territories honestly you know they and they might feel incentivized to take pot shots or something if they're going past the philippines just to be like hey stay out of my stay out of my way but I, if they're not actually like going if they're not attacking the philippines and america's still trying to remain kind of isolationist and neutral as much as possible then like wh why attack america itself okay i'm not sure it doesn't really make a ton of sense to me but let's continue and so with that history was set japan set its powerful kido butai to strike pearl harbor on the morning of december 7th now the goal of the raids was as follows 1. Sink a battleship. This was for propaganda purposes. Japan reasoned that if America saw their beloved battleships, symbols of their naval power destroyed, their will to wage war against Japan would be shattered as well. Okay. 2. Immobilize the fleet for 6 months. The Japanese estimated that they needed 6 months to do all their conquests. Then they would be on the defensive and await the American counterattacks and wear them down, culminating in a decisive naval clash. So note, the Japanese knew they could not win a long-term war with America, so Japanese strategy revolved on them waging a short-term war. This was why attacking the fuel tanks or naval facilities at Pearl Harbor was not even considered in the planning phase. Okay, so they wanted to destroy a battleship to break America's morale 
so that they wouldn't even want to join the fight. That, well, I guess no one would even try that today because they know it wouldn't work. But I guess at the time, America wasn't necessarily, was it not known for just coming out of the gate swinging? I guess they, they were coming, we were coming off of a long period of isolationism as much as possible. So it's like we joined World War I late because people didn't want to do it because they wanted to stay isolationist. I know, I remember that. So I guess Jap Japan was maybe still f operating on the assumption that America didn't really want to fight, that they didn't really have a dog in this race. So why would, I don't know. It still, it doesn't make a ton of sense. I would still think that post World War One, people would know that if you attack America's stuff, actually, you know what? I guess they wouldn't because America that was not like they sent people into World War One, but none of nothing in America was actually attacked. So I guess they it wouldn't have really occurred to anybody. America had been kind of like rude about uh, pushing other people out of their out of their space so that makes sense that america doesn't they know that america doesn't want people in their space so they'd want to avoid going past the territory but there's not really a lot of stuff of anyone actually attacking america so there's not really a way to know how the response is going to be okay okay that makes a little bit more sense now i think i've talked myself into a place where i can kind of understand even though <laughs> Not not fully, but I guess I can kind of see where there's not, they don't have enough information, essentially. It was irrelevant to the six month goal. Okay. At Pearl Harbor were some 80 ships. There were eight battleships, seven of them in battleship role and one in dry dock. Eight okay. cruisers were at Pearl Harbor, four of which were accessible to torpedoes and dozens of destroyers and auxiliaries were docked elsewhere. Okay. Unfortunately for the Japanese, the three American carriers were all at sea and not in port that fateful day. That was lucky for the us. The attack on Pearl Harbor would be carried out by six fleet carriers and its strike force of 350 planes. Their crews had endured 10 months of training for this attack. Okay. In addition, five midget submarines would be tasked with penetrating the harbor and attacking in conjunction with the main airstrike. The attack would be composed of two waves. During the first wave, Lieutenant Fuchida commanded a strike against the ships in the harbor. The key to the first wave was the 50 level bombers and 40 torpedo bombers, also known as Kates. Their torpedoes had been modified with wooden fins so that they could be effective in the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. Okay, that's clever. Their priority targets were the battleships and carriers at port. The first wave of 183 aircraft was launched at 6 a.m. The strike force approached Oahu and soon the formation separated into groups to attack their assigned airfields and targets. The sky was completely clear of American fighters. The Japanese had achieved complete surprise. The dive bombers beat the torpedo bombers to Pearl Harbor, the first bombs hitting the southern tip of Fort Island minutes before even the first torpedo had been launched. Planes from Hiru and Soryu approached at 7.55. They were disappointed to discover that their targets, the carriers, were not in port that day. Lieutenant Nagai, leader of Soryu's air group, realized there were no potential targets, so he and his wingman pulled off. However, okay. the remaining six attacked. They probably mistook the OD commission battleship, the USS Utah, as a capital ship, and they fired upon her. Two torpedoes slammed into her before 8 a.m. The rest missed. One missed so badly that the USS Raleigh was hit. The Utah capsized at 8.12. The Raleigh almost suffered a similar fate, but prompt damage control prevented her from capsizing. That's not so much a miss. It still hit something. Nagai went around Ford Island and launched against what he believed was a battleship. In reality, it was just a cruiser, the USS Helena. She was double berthed with an old mine layer, the Oglala. Its silhouette probably gave the impression of a battleship. Okay. His torpedo actually went under Oglala's heel and exploded into Helena's hull, damaging both ships. Nagai's wingman recognized that it was just a cruiser and decided to attack Battleship Row instead. The eight Hiru planes didn't fare any better. Lieutenant Hirata and his wingman saw that there were no viable targets, so they headed for Battleship Row. However, the remaining six aircraft who were lagging behind got to see Nagai's attack on Helena and followed suit. Four launched torpedoes, but they all missed terribly. Okay. The last pair aborted their run at the last minute and headed for the battleships. So now we have four Hiru and one Soryu plane maneuvering for Battleship Row. 
cutting right across the path of the other 24 torpedo bombers who are just coming in. I guess I kind of want to be a little bit, like tease them a little bit for having trained for 10 months and still almost no one's hitting the target. But I guess that does make, I mean, it makes sense. It's, I think it would be really difficult to hit the target. And it's sort of like, it makes a little bit more sense now too, why um, in Star Wars, when the they're all doing the dog fight and they're all like shooting at the Death Star trying to hit their targets, it, almost no one is actually managing to do it. Um, because like, again, in that movie, it means like, but you have the lock on, you have the thing, it's right there, you have the technology, but it's still difficult to hit. And I guess I kind of appreciate the realism of that a little bit more now that I'm seeing these people who did practice, like they were, were they trained for almost a year for this and they still are, were not managing to, to hit anything. So, I mean, that's impressive. And like the fact that anyone's managing to hit anything is impressive. Um, it does seem that a lot of the reason that they failed, well, they didn't, you know, they failed, they didn't do what they wanted to do. They didn't fully achieve all of their goals, it seems, is because they had a lot of bad intelligence. So I do wonder a little bit about that. Like, why was their intelligence out so outdated that, because I don't know if I would consider this really a failure. They, they haven't managed to hit what they wanted to hit yet, but they're still managing to do some de make some devastation happen. In this photograph, you can see the opening stages of the attack. Both the Utah and Raleigh have oh, wow. been hit, and Utah is listening to port. At this moment, the torpedo runs against the battleships have begun. You can even spot two planes finishing their bomb runs. Cool. I didn't realize that uh, they had a picture from so early on in the attack. I knew that there was a couple from later on, but I didn't realize there was one at the beginning. Due to the geography of Pearl Harbor, the torpedo bombers really just had one avenue of approach. If they had gone over the naval buildings, the turbulence would have thrown off their accuracy and limited their launch window. Therefore, oh, okay. the overwhelming majority of the Cape bombers flew single seconds. file down the southeast lock. The result was that instead of the attack being spread out, it would be disproportionately concentrated on the southern tip of Battleship Row, much to Oklahoma's and West Virginia's despair. Yeah. Twelve Akagi planes approach single file, a thousand feet apart, starting at 757. All of Akagi's twelve planes launched against these two battleships. Wow. Except one, which skillfully maneuvered and struck the California. The four Hiru planes from before joined shortly afterwards and launched against Oklahoma and West Virginia. Contrary to belief the Japanese were not attacking with impunity, the defenders had taken advantage of the precious minutes warning afforded by the Fort Allen bomb blast. Oh. So that when the first torpedo planes of Akagi approached, many anti-aircraft gunners were already prepared. Oh, that's These cool. slow-moving Kates had to make their torpedo runs under fire. Three miles behind Akagi's strike was Kaga's air group. By now, the anti-aircraft fire was becoming more effective, and again, Oklahoma and West Virginia took the brunt of the attack. In the middle of their launch, that single, Soryu plane from earlier, swept in and got a hit on the California. However, one of Kaga's plane veered to the right because of this, but was able to hit the Nevada at 8.03. Kaga's air group was the only one to suffer losses. Five of the last seven attacking Kates were shot down. Oh, wow. Okay. In this historic photograph, the torpedo attack is perfectly captured. You can see the torpedo hits on the Oklahoma, West Virginia, and the California. All of them are gushing out oil. In the background, you can see Hickam Field burning, and the Helena can be seen leaning against the Oglala. Oh, that's cool. And a Japanese plane can also be spotted. Who is taking these pictures? That's fantastic. However, the attack wasn't executed as smoothly as hoped. An attack that should oh. have taken less than 90 seconds stretched out over 11 minutes from first run to last. This Some whole... had to abort and redo their runs due to mutual interference, and the heavy anti-aircraft fire threw off the pilot's aim and caused them to over-concentrate on just two battleships. I didn't realize that the whole thing was supposed to only take about 90 seconds. That's, I mean, that's an interesting factoid. I had no idea that it was planned to be so small, but this whole video has kind of been about how nothing has gone according to the plan fire threw off the pilot's aim and caused them to over concentrate on just two battleships. 21 torpedoes were launched at Oklahoma and West Virginia, over half of the available torpedoes. Wow. Oklahoma had 12 torpedoes launched at her. 
five hit her and she capsized in 15 minutes. Wow. West Virginia was hit by seven torpedoes, but prompt counterfeiting prevented her from capsizing and she settled to the bottom. Oh, okay, just think. California should not have sunk from two torpedoes, but her hatches were open for inspection that morning, which contributed to her sinking. And she was abandoned due to fires, and when she was reboarded, it was too late. Of the 36 torpedoes launched, only 19 achieved hits. That's a 48% hit rate. 10,000 feet above how is that, though? Cheetah and his high-level bomb. Like, again, as I said before, like it sounds like it's a lot more difficult than movies make it seem to hit hit anything so is 48 percent actually not terrible is that why there's so many like because they know that it's difficult to actually hit it if it doesn't tell me in this let me know in the comments bombers their mission was to take out the inboard battleships inaccessible to torpedoes they came in groups of five they released their salvos and scored an impressive 20 percent hit rate unfortunately for the japanese out of the 10 bomb hits wait no no they're explaining. They're explaining the thing I just asked about again. 20% hit rate. 20% hit rate. Impressive when compared to what they had expected from their pilot. They didn't even expect them to get 20%. Why do you train them for 10 months then if you didn't expect them to hit anything? Unfortunately for the Japanese. I Japanese photograph. Oh, the, the Japanese took this picture. Okay. During the high level bombing. The bomb splashes. Okay. So they weren't expecting them to hit much. According to this. Interesting. Out of the 10 bomb hits, about six were low order detonations or malfunctions. That is an outrageous 60% dud rate. The Japanese aviators were greatly let down by their weaponry. The yeah. damage could have been deadlier. However, the distribution was effective. California was missed, but two ineffective hits on Maryland were scored. Both West Virginia and the Tennessee were hit twice. And there were two additional collateral damage hits on the repair ship Vestal, moored outboard of the Arizona. Vestal suffered severe flooding and had to be beached afterwards. But all of these hits were overshadowed by the two hits on the USS Arizona. The first mm. struck her aft on the quarter deck, and another landed near her number two turret. It caused a magazine explosion, which exploded with a great force and a tremendous fireball was seen. Oh, wow. Okay. She split in half and sunk in the harbor, taking more than a thousand sailors with her. Heavy fires burned for days. The explosion was actually caught on tape by Dr. Hackinson, who was on the hospital ship Solis. Oh my God. See, this is why they kept saying like it's it seems like it's almost a failure but this is why it wasn't a failure there i there was a ton of people who died half of all of the people came from the arizona Jeez. it's like everything that is that this video has been saying so far is like well this didn't go right and this didn't go right and this didn't go right and it almost sounds like they're describing this as like an ineffective or like a not a an effective attack but just because it didn't go according to plan didn't mean that things did not go essentially correctly. That's a lot of people who died. Nevada was the only battleship not suffering heavy damage and capable of getting underway. She did so at 840 with the intention of heading out of the channel. Now. One of the mini subs actually did make it into the harbor. The other four were unsuccessful. At 8.36, the sea tender, the USS Curtis, spotted a sub. The submarine fired at Curtis but missed. In return, the submarine was hit by a 5-inch shell. The destroyer Monaghan, which happened to be getting underway at this moment, saw the sub and approached with the intent to ram her. The sub turned and fired its last torpedo, which missed the destroyer. At 8.40, the sub was rammed and death charged. She sunk with both crew members killed. Oh my god, we're only on the freaking second wave. Jeez, I didn't realize that was all the first. I guess I was, I got confused when they started talking about the other, the second group of planes, I think. Because this is our, okay. Oh, Aisha. 
Because again, like every every other word is like, well, this didn't, they failed, they missed, they didn't do this, they, they didn't realize that this didn't happen, but there's still so much damage. 167 planes formed the attack of the second wave, of which 78 were dive bombers allocated to go against warships. Much was expected from these skilled pilots, however, their performance was disappointing. Hmm. First, take a moment to see what they were up against. By now, the anti-aircraft defenses were up and ready to greet the dive bombers. Couple this with the fact that there was a 70 to 90% low overcast, their accuracy was destined to be off. Mm. But most importantly, these pilots were guilty of poor target selection. This was their priority list. These dive bombers were their general purpose bombers. Alright, I'm gonna read these. Oh no! These were guilty of poor target selection. This was their priority list. Aircraft these carriers, none present. Cruisers, only eight, three, priority three, battleships, destroyers, sea ten tenders, and auxiliary ships were not on the target list. All right, so the second wave was priority three was battleships, even though earlier they said that their main thing was they wanted to sink at least one. Uh, so that was, I think, in the first wave, they really wanted to get those battleships. But here, the carriers, and they don't even have them there. That's unfortunate. These dive bombers with their general purpose really. bombs were well suited for attacking the eight cruisers left in Pearl Harbor. But during the attack, about roughly 30 attack battleships, only 17 went for cruisers, 16 attack destroyers, and 12 attack auxiliaries. Oh, why? The attack began at 8.54. The USS Nevada was caught in its escape during the second wave. The prospect of sinking the ship in the channel and thus blocking access to Pearl Harbor was a very, very improbable outcome. However, the pilots couldn't resist the opportunity, so they attacked from two directions. 14 to 18 vows dropped against Nevada. Nevada was hit five times by 9 o'clock. And at 9.10, she had to beat herself. This was the shining moment of the second wave. Yeah, wow. But it deserves to be criticized. Okay. Did they contribute to sinking a battleship? Yeah, but it was by the rarest of luck. Nevada succumbed not to Japanese bombs, but to poor material condition, critical design flaws, and a massively significant damage control mistake. And again, it still doesn't make it any wiser. The battleship should have been avoided. The attempt to sink Nevada in the channel was a waste of ordnance that could have been better employed against targets more vulnerable to their effects. One to three dive bombers went for California, scoring one hit. The USS Pennsylvania, the fleet's flagship, the only battleship in dock, was also poorly selected. Nine bombers went after her. She suffered only a single hit at 906. The real victims, though, were the two destroyers ahead of her, which received collateral damage. Two hit okay. the Cassin and one hit the Downs, heavily damaging both. Oh my god. So there could be a cultural explanation to why the Japanese pilots went for battleships. These young 20 year old pilots were going into the most significant battle in Japan's history. No one wanted to go back home and report that they attacked a simple cruiser or a destroyer. No way. They wanted to go for battleships, sticking true to their samurai spirit. But overall, the second wave attack was just scattered throughout Pearl Harbor, with many attacks missing their targets. And it looks like missing entirely. A puzzling target selection was the destroyer USS Shaw, which was targeted by as many as 15 bombers. Three bombs hit her, one of which unleashed a tremendous fireball. The reason to her being targeted was probably because she was in a floating dry dock and resembled a capital ship. On the west side, the Curtis, a sea tender, was inexplicably targeted. A damaged foul committed a suicide dive and crashed into her, and minutes later, she was hit by a bomb. Okay, so I, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily fully inexplicable then. The plane was already damaged. He wants to go out, like, with a bang. Which is a, a bad way of phrasing that. Sorry. But so, yeah, no, I don't think that's totally inexplicable. He wants to make a name for himself or he wants to do well by his people. So he's going to he's already and he's already going down. Might as well take someone else with you when you go. Like, I feel that. I understand that. And lastly, the only hit on a top priority target was on the rally. As many as five dive bombers went for her, still listing from that torpedo hit. She was hit once at 908. Also, we can add a near miss on the Honolulu, which caused minor damage. 
so only one hit and one damage near miss were achieved on the dive bomber's highest priority targets. Wow. Against the 55% accuracy rate achieved during their training, the pilots got only 15 hits. That's a rather disappointing 19% hit rate. Was the visibility that bad? Because they did mention the visibility was terrible and like, I guess you're maybe nervous, but like 10 months of training and you're doing okay during training that, again, I, how difficult is it actually? It must be very difficult. It's got to be very, very difficult, right? It was a poor performance of the second wave. It contributed nothing substantial to the fleet in Pearl Harbor. Also, as in the case of the armor-piercing bombs, the general purpose bombs were deficient. But the second- All right, we are, we are still playing the game where we drink whenever I say something stupid. So we're probably about, I, I should have drank a lot more. <laughs> I should have gone, I should be down here. I know I've said a lot of stupid things today. Definitely feel free to let me know how much of an idiot I am, but in a nice way. And don't get mad at me necessarily for not knowing stuff. Get mad at the American school system. Also, as in the case of the armor-piercing bombs, the general purpose bombs were deficient. But were the deficient. second wave had the opportunity to be more damaging. Take, for example, the Phoenix here, a modern cruiser which was completely ignored by the second wave, not to mention the first wave of torpedo bombers. She was a suitable target. But even more telling was the fact that the naval yard was basically ignored. Four modern 10-ton cruisers were tied up here, all of them packed so closely together. One could hardly have missed anything of value had the attack been concentrated here. On top of this, these ships were in a very vulnerable position. Flammable materials were scattered throughout, hatches were open, fire main systems might have been isolated, a bomb hit here would have caused a tremendous fire and been particularly devastating. And there was no smoke around this area at all. The Japanese missed the chance to deliver a more effective blow. Only about 10 dive bombers attacked this area, and as previously mentioned, only a damage near miss caused any damage whatsoever. Wow. By 9.30, the attack was over. We got lucky, yo. The attack left behind 2,335 people dead and another 1,178 wounded. Civilian casualties totaled 103, including 68 dead. Five battleships have been sunk, but only two were permanent losses, the Arizona and the Oklahoma. The rest were repaired and served before the war's end. The other three battleships at Pearl Harbor suffered light damage. However, this attack didn't really cripple the Pacific Fleet. Soon the Japanese would yeah. realize that it wasn't these old obsolete battleships that posed the real danger to them. It was the carriers that they had missed. They would soon feel their vengeance half a year later. See, again, that's what I said. Like, it, it really seems that like the the biggest downfall of the Japanese here was that they had outdated information. Every Everything that they tried to do would have made sense, but they did not have up-to-date information. And so I just wonder why they didn't. Uh, like, who was responsible for collecting that information and who failed to pass it along? Um, I mean, we had lucked up. We got lucky. I mean, it's tough to say that because... 2,000 people died and another thousand were injured. That's a lot of casualties. That's a lot of damage. But if the Japanese had been up to date on their information, that could have been a lot more devastating. And we might not have been able to join the war at all, which is what they wanted. To the list, we can add a target ship and a mine layer and the repair ship Vestal, which was beached. There was heavy to moderate damage to three destroyers, two light cruisers, and a sea tender and there was light damage to a light cruiser. The Japanese also achieved great success on their strikes on the airfield spread out on Oahu. Over 160 planes were destroyed. Wow. They destroyed two to three times the number of aircraft that they had expected. Okay. okay. The Japanese lost only 29 planes, nine in the first wave, 20 in the second wave. A testament to the Americans' quick air defense. Also, none of Japan's five midget submarines made it back. Okay. Was the mission accomplished? Well, yes. Kind of. All four battleships hit by torpedoes were out of the war for six months or more. Okay, so they, they even got the six one months. one other battleship by bombs alone. And with that, the Kido Butai sailed back home, unscathed. World War II had just started for America, and the sneak attack left behind a temporary shock nation, but a nation that afterwards would be resolved to finish the war with nothing less than a total victory on their side. Yeah. 
Like, the Japanese had awoken a sleeping giant. Okay. Again, uh, I do still wonder, you know, uh, what they thought they would accomplish by directly attacking the United States. Because it, it really does seem that that was guaranteed to piss America off and make them join the war. But I suppose if their plan had worked, if they had managed to have the correct information and actually hit the things that they needed to hit, it would have it would have been a lot more devastating if they'd hit the cruisers, if the if the carriers had been in dock. Why weren't they? Why weren't they there? Like, cause were they just doing? I don't remember if they mentioned it. I don't remember if they mentioned why the carriers weren't there because they knew that they wouldn't all be. But why were none of them there? So if anyone, uh, if if I missed that, let me know. Cause. I mean, that just seems like there's a lot of bad luck against the Japanese, even if they technically did accomplish their goal. They didn't accomplish their end goal, which was demoralization and making sure America couldn't participate. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. And again, the... This, the sneak attack factor has always been the part that has been really, really hounded into to us in, in school. It's like they, you know, caught us by surprise. I thought I'd heard somewhere that maybe it wasn't as much of a sneak attack as, as we've been led to believe, but that might also just be a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Anyway, uh, like I said, we play the game here where every time I say something entirely stupid, take a drink. So y'all probably should have finished your drinks by now. I certainly should have finished my drink because I know for a fact I was I was off base on some things. Um, but in, anyway, thank you again, Mid Grievous, because I do enjoy learning about this stuff. I wish I retained more information about uh, Pearl Harbor, about World War II, the stuff that I learned in school, but it was a long time ago and I didn't retain nearly as much. And also, again, we didn't really learn a lot of the details. I had no idea about there were, there were three waves at all. I didn't know that the what their plans were. I didn't know that we knew their plans. I didn't know that it was because they were trying to make America not join the war by not straight, you know, sneaking past the Philippines. Um, so that's, inter I appreciate that. I like to learn stuff. I'm always interested also to, to learn a little bit more about, you know, the things that we're supposed, we, like, we all think we know, oh yeah, 1941, we know, we know December 7th, we know War Pearl Harbor, we know all that, but there's always something you don't know. And I'm always fascinated to find out. So thanks again for uh, suggesting the video. Thanks for sticking with me. Thanks for drinking with me. Uh, when every time <laughs> I say something moronic, um, and you know, anyway, anything you want else you want me to react to anything else you want to make fun of me for not knowing, let us know in the comments. Uh, obviously we do look through them and we might even pick your video. So thanks again. Make sure that you uh, like comment, subscribe, uh, Check out our Patreon if you want to become a member of that. You get a bunch of fun perks. And I will see you guys next time.